You guys have a good weekend so far? You guys seen Black Panther yet? So good. Go see it. Uh, you need to. It's Black History Month, so do your part. Um, it's good to be here. Um, we are jumping back into our study of the book of Luke and the Bible. We're in chapter 16, and my sermon today is titled, A Jesus Who is Better Than Money. Better than Money. What do you guys think is, is better? In and out or Shake Shack? What do you think is better? Uh, Starbucks or Coffee and Tea Collective? <laughs> what do you think is better, uh, iPhone or the Pixel? <laughs> okay, how about this one? What's better, rain or sunshine? Yeah. Kansas, California. All right? San Diego, L.A. San Diego! All right, here we go. See, we get things that are better. What you think is, is better. better. Have you ever uh, stopped in, to think about the concept of, of better? Better? It's actually something unique to human beings alone that, that they contemplate and compare things. Animals don't do that. Animals don't question their own existence and think about the future and what is going to be best for themselves. They act according to what? Animal instinct, right? Better. If you stop and think about it, nearly every single decision that we ever make in our life is at, is at some level because we think one thing will be better for us than the other, better, either better in that moment or better for us in the future. that will hopefully do something good for us in the future. Better. My, my favorite argument for the existence of God is, is known, or it's called the ontological argument. It was written by a man named Anselm in the 11th century. I actually have part of it tattooed on my arm. I loved it so much. At the core element of, of the argument is this concept of, of better, that we can, we can compare things and that some things are truly better than others. And what he proposes is that, that God is the best. He defines God as that which None greater or none better can be conceived. This is what I believe is at the heart of Jesus' teaching in the text we're going to look at today. That, that, that believing in God and, and loving him is the better thing in life. Better than anything else. Jesus comes to teach us and to show us that he is better than money. Which is usually the primary thing that we tend to think will make our lives better. So... With that, why don't you go ahead and stand with me. We're going to read the text for today. I'll read it, declare it as God's word. We can thank him for it together and then get into it. So we are, we're doing all of chapter 16. So here we go. He is, Jesus also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a, a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, well, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people will receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. Master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwelling. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or be, will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts, for what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. 
There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with that which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, Send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. All right, so uh, honestly, confession, I thought of titling this sermon, Weird Jesus. Weird Jesus. I, I, so when, when I first sit down with the text that I'm going to preach for, you know, I sit down and, and I, I just read through line by line and I, I just write down everything that kind of comes to mind, you know, and questions that I have and, and comments and, and just to kind of get in. So I found myself repeating, repeatedly writing like, that's weird. That's odd. Huh? What the heck? Weird, 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 weird Jesus. <laughs> I don't know, did, did any of you have any of those thoughts while we were just reading through this passage? You're like, what's going on? I mean, make friends by unrighteous wealth so that you can get eternal dwellings? What the heck is that? Force your way into the kingdom? Uh, I mean, obviously we got these like two stories about money, but what's this little bit about divorce just sandwiched in there? What does that have to do with anything? Uh, I mean, then there's all this weird stuff about this guy who's, who's stuck in hell and all he wants is someone to dip his finger in water and like put it on his tongue. Okay. That's weird, Jesus. Like, that's weird. Um, it turns out, once I started reading commentaries, the scholarly experts on this, they said that this is actually the most difficult parable of Jesus to interpret and understand in all of Luke and in the Bible. Um, so uh, I was like, can I just like skip this chapter? Like, uh, but my boss said no. So um, just true confession, like I'm not that excited about preaching through this passage today, but everybody has things about their job that they have to do at times that they don't want to do. So that's me today. Um, that's an honest feeling. However, the Bible tells us that all of it is God's word, and all of it is good for us, very good for us. Sometimes, um, I think you have to go digging for diamonds. I mean, I've never dug and found a diamond. That would be cool, but um, supposedly so. Uh, anyway, I think this chapter is like this. As I dug into it, and as, as we're about to dig into it together, I think we'll see that there's diamonds here. Jesus says some, some challenging and somewhat odd things to really force us to think about some things that really matter. That have the, he has this, this, this unique way of casting light on what's really true, what really matters, and what's really good for us. So three things I want to walk through today. Uh, we're going to look at better riches, better future, and better promise, and I just hope we walk away thinking and believing and knowing that Jesus really is better. Jesus is better. So let's jump into this first point, better riches, looking at verses 1 through 16, where Jesus tells the story about a business relationship gone very bad. Uh, this guy does some sketchy things, and then uh, after telling the story, Jesus offers some commentary and teaching from it. So, so first, let me clue you in on a, on a good rule or guide in, in reading and understanding and interpreting the Bible, working with the Bible. The, the stories that Jesus told back in his day, they were called parables. And, and parables are a, a real unique kind, of, a special kind of story. They, they were often made up and they would deal with a very common situation in life that would be familiar to, to everyone, easily 
to relate to and understand. But here's the key or the trick to parables is that parables typically only have one main point. Only one main point. There's a, there's a pointed kicker that, that's meant to, to, to cut to the heart that you just kind of get like a sock in, in the gut all of a sudden, typically at the end. This parable is a perfect I- example of that. It has one main point to it, not to love money, not to love money. And, and the Pharisee guys who were, who were standing around, they, they got the kicker. They got that suck in the gut, and it, it ticked them off. Like, they knew, they, they got it all of a sudden, that Jesus was jabbing at them. So verse 14 says, the Pharisees who were lovers of money, they heard of these things, they heard this, this parable, and they ridiculed him. They're upset at Jesus. What people... When people often go screwy with parables or come up with weird things from the Bible, it's often because they try to line up and interpret every little part of, of the parable and try and make it connect to something significant. But a parable has one main point. And so with this parable, what most people, when they've tried to do that, the problem that they had is that it, it kind of sounds like Jesus commends this, this dishonest finance and property manager who had embezzled money. Uh, and it sounds like he's commending him. And, but Jesus' point really has nothing to do with this guy's dishonesty. Now, we can learn something from anyone, even dishonest people. We, whether anybody's, you can learn something from anyone, whether they're not they're good or bad, Christian or, or not. Uh, here's how St. Augustine said it. Well, I want to say a brief word about St. Augustine first. So, uh, Augustine is known as one of the early church fathers. Uh, he was a primary figure who helped guide and lead the Christian church in the 4th and 5th century, so the, the late 300s, early 400s, led the church in his pastoral efforts, in his writings, and in his leadership of Christian councils, a great man of God. And here's the thing that you may not know about Augustine is that he was a, a black man who was born in Algeria, ended up spending the bulk of his ministerial career in North Africa. This is an old painting done of him. I bring, I bring this up because, in case you didn't know, we've been trying to mention this in our services. It is Black History Month, and I think it's important for us to recognize the heritage of our faith that has come to us. Christianity is not a white man's religion. Uh, Jesus himself was a Middle Eastern dark-skinned man, and there have been people of all different colors of skin who have been changed by him, and his message, and have contributed to the spread of the good news. If you want to read a good book on that, check out how Africa shaped the Christian mind, rediscovering, rediscovering the African seedbed of Western Christianity. Great book, Thomas Oden. He talks about Augustine and a lot of other people's influence. So back to the parable. Here's what St. Augustine said on this parable. He says, why did the Lord Jesus Christ present this parable to us? He surely did not approve that a, a cheat of his servant who cheated his master stole from him and did not make it up from his own pocket. Why did the Lord set this before us? Why did the Lord set this before us? Is it not because that servant cheated, but because he exercised foresight for the future? He was ensuring for himself a life. And then he says, would you not for yourself ensure eternal life? And that This is the point of the parable. You see, What Jesus says the issue is in verse 11 is true riches. That true riches, they do not consist in the accumulation of wealth. That's what the finance manager realized. I mean, his money's gone and he doesn't want to do anything else. He's He's got to make some friends fast in order to have some kind of a life to be able to live. But sadly, back in Jesus' day and still so much in our day, this is the lie that we constantly hear and find ourselves so easily believing that's, that's that if we had more money, our life would be better. If we had more money, our life, it would make our lives better. It comes to us seemingly constantly. I mean, every day in something we're reading or seeing on social media or watching on TV or the, or the movies or the celebrities and this and that, seeing the success of, of others around us in our peer group or whatever. You think that, man, if we just had more money, our lives would be better. It's, it's hard not to, to, to think that. I find myself easily starting to think that, man, if we just had more money, you know, then, oh, we could get a bigger house. We could have some nicer things, be able to do some more things. My wife and kids would be happier. We'd have a happier life if we just had more. 
The thing is, it's, it's simply not true. Something happens in our souls when we start to think that way. Money, it can, it has this, it just has this power to get this grip and this hold on, on our heart. Every time, you think about it, every time we spend money, here's what's going on. We're pulling something out of our hearts and showing what we value. <laughs> every time we spend money, we're pulling something out of our hearts to show what we value. It's not, it's not surprising that Jesus says in verse 13 that what it really boils down to is either loving God or loving money, one or the other. Uh, book I've been reading for my, my own personal soul this year uh, in my personal times as a Lord is this book by another old dead dude, uh, uh, Bernard of Clairvaux. It's titled On Loving God, and he says some really good stuff in this I read the other day. The so men are driven by an insatiable ambition to clutch at still greater prizes, and nowhere is there any final satisfaction, because nothing there can be defined as absolutely the best or highest. No matter how many such things one has, he is always lusting after what he has not. Never at peace. He sighs for new possessions. Discontented, he spends himself in fruitless toil and finds only weariness in the evanescent and unreal pleasures of the world. In his greediness, he counts all that he has clutched as nothing in comparison to what is beyond his grasp and loses all pleasure by longing after what he has not yet covets. It is so that these ones wander in a circle, longing after something to gratify their yearnings, yet madly rejecting that which alone can bring them to their desired end, the love of God. God has no gift better than himself. He gives himself as prize and reward, and therein the soul says, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Isn't that good? I think this is what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about true riches and an, an eternal dwelling, the better choice of, of loving God and instead of loving and pursuing money, money that cannot love you back. Do you, do you love God? Or do you love money? Your life will end up being about one of those two things. You can't serve both. You've got to pick your destination. We tend to think that what we do with our money isn't that big of a deal. Jesus here says it's a huge deal. It's like an eternal deal. And that the love of God is so much better. So much so that we ought to be doing anything to get it, to have, have the love of God, pursuing it at all costs. Just like the, the shrewd manager here, he goes, into, he goes into panic mode. Like that, we've got to do whatever it takes to have God in our lives. I believe that's what Jesus is talking about in verse 16. He says you've got to force your way into the kingdom of Evan, sometimes you've got you to make some hard decisions about money in order to show where your allegiance and trust is and what your life's really going to be about. It's one of the reasons why I just love our, our family's commitment to give a portion of our money each month to the church. Not only because we believe in the, the mission of, of our church but, and, you know, what it's doing, but it has this effect of, of kind of pulling my pulling my heart free from the love of money. Where I, I say, Lord, I'm going to trust you to provide for what I need, and your love is better, and spreading that love is far more important than to me having that little bit of extra, that 10% that I give. If this is your home church and you don't, you don't do that already, I'd highly encourage you to start. Honestly, it feels really good just to to get free of the power of money, just be able to let go of, of, of some and trusting it to God, freely giving to Jesus' church and a mission. But, but even then, I think we still got to remember that the bigger issue is our hearts. It's not just about giving money at church. It's on our, our hearts and where our eyes are set. Because, you see, you can, you can give money to the church and, like, check it off, but still have your heart and hope set and the desire of your life being making more money, believing that money is the thing that will actually really make your life better. And that's what Jesus is addressing here, I believe. So I'll, I'll end this point with a quote from another great black theologian, the notorious B.I.G. More money, more problems. Okay? True things. Huh. Jesus and what we have in his kingdom is 
far better, far better than money. All right, so let's look at, let's move on to our next point, a better future. Look at the other parable in verse 17 through 31. Uh, what we have here in the second parable is a look at the alternative. Jesus' teaching from the first parable focuses on the goodness of heaven and the downfalls of loving money. And this second parable focuses on the horrors of hell and the benefit of being merciful to others with our money. In between the two parables is this line about, brief line about marriage and divorce where Jesus says that it's not God's plan for you to be divorced, as not to get divorced. Most think here it's another example of hypocrisy because the Pharisees not only loved money more than God, but they were letting couples get divorced instead of encouraging them in the love of God for one another. Interestingly, money is the the number two most popular reason that's given for why couples get divorced of those that do. First is cheating, and the second is, is money. God's desire for relationships, particularly the marriage relationship, is that it's, it's formed and it's fostered and it's fueled by love, by God's love. That's God's desire and design. God, God is the source of love. He is love. God never divorces himself and his love from his people. Never. He calls us to love our spouses with that same kind of love. Even when money is bad and creates all kinds of problems in marriage, even when well, if some, your spouse like cheats on you, when that happens, yeah. There's actually a whole book of the Bible about that called Hosea. And, and his wife... Gomer cheats on him multiple times, and God tells him, hey, I want you to take her back every single time because that's a picture of my love for my people who keep cheating on me. <laughs> the consequences of divorce are, are painful. I've walked through it with multiple couples. Ugh, it, it just tears lives apart. I think that's one of the reasons why, why the way that the, the Bible defines marriage, what it calls it, is becoming one flesh. <laughs> So when a couple's end up divorced, they literally, they're tearing their own flesh and their lives apart. The oneness that occurs in, in marriage, it, it, the chasm of divorce just splits and tears that apart. Marriage is meant to be a permanent covenant no matter what. Now, if you're here and you've been divorced, there's tons and loads of grace from God. He's a loving God no matter what, but the things that go wrong in our life. But you need to know, keep your marriage at all costs. <laughs> I actually have couples that go through premarital counseling with me. I have them, uh, after a number of weeks and going through things, I have them sit down and draft a a paragraph, a paper for me, titled, Why This Marriage Will Not End in Divorce. And then I put it in my file, so then a few years later, when they're fighting, they want to get a divorce, I can pull it out and read it to them. So it works. So after talking about divorce, Jesus introduces this parable about another permanent chasm, where one's... Life choices with money and mercy have eternal consequences. It's, it's a pretty graphic and, and picturesque story he tells. It's not a, not a delightful one, but he gives a lot of details and really paints a picture for us. So it, we've got this rich guy. He's, he's all dressed up in the, the purple robes of, of a king. He's got all kinds of money. He's, he's feasting every single day. But he does nothing for the guy who's outside of his gate, in front of his house, that's poor, hungry, and sick, and has sores that dogs are licking. Gross picture. Uh, The rich man has no mercy toward him. They both die, and then what happens is there's this whole role reversal that takes place. Now the poor, hungry, sick beggar named Lazarus is in heaven feasting with the great Abraham and the rich man is nameless. He's in hell in anguish and in torment where there's fire. And now he's become the beggar. It's, it's so hot and painful. He just wants a drop of water on his tongue. But he's told no. And that once you're in hell, there's no way to get out of there and make a change and go to heaven. It's permanent. So kind of crazy story, right? Which stirs up like a bunch of questions. Is, is this real? Is this like what hell's really like? Uh, I mean, is it true you, you can't get out of um, hell? Or is there a place like called purgatory like the Catholic Church teaches? Does hell really have fire? I mean, are you just being burned up forever without burning up? How does that work? I mean, can people that are in hell really see into heaven? 
I mean, crazy stuff, right? And, and I know the answer to all of those questions. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but I think this is a good guide. Good guide. What is clear, so we move from the clear to the less clear, is that Jesus is giving a very vivid description of spiritual torment. All right? We can agree on that. So then, what about the questions? Is he speaking literally here or symbolically? I don't know, but if he is speaking symbolically, then imagine how much worse the real thing is. Right? Which brings us to the heart of this difficult topic is that in multiple times and multiple places, Jesus teaches that there is a heaven and that there is a hell. And that every one of us will end up in one of those two places when either we die or when Jesus returns. On Wednesday this week at 99 years old, one of my personal heroes got to enter the eternal dwelling in heaven with God and his people in the city of joy, Billy Graham. Um, so I, I wanted to quote Billy today, and I thought it would be fitting to quote some of his things he said on on heaven and hell. So in his book titled Peace with God, he writes this, I'm conscious of the fact that the subject of hell is not a very pleasant one, very unpopular, controversial, and misunderstood. Yet the Bible pronounces hell for the sinner and heaven for the saint. A saint has been described as a sinner who has been forgiven. The subject of heaven is much easier to accept than the subject of hell. And yet, the Bible teaches both. When we look at the parable that Jesus told, the, what the rich man failed to see was that, that he himself was a man who needed mercy as well. But he ignored the, the man sleeping outside of his, his gate. The central command of the Bible is to love God and to love neighbor. Jesus said, that's the how we can summarize the whole Bible in that. Lazarus had literally become his neighbor outside of his gate, but the rich man had no love for him, which showed he had no love for God in his heart. Even when he's in hell, he's still thinking that Lazarus should do something for him. <laughs> Oh, put this drop of water on my tongue. And then he's, he's actually asking Abraham to do something for his relatives, still ordering people around. When it comes to money, what we have to see is that it's, it's simply a tool for us to show and share the love of God. It doesn't mean being foolish and not planning and not saving, that it's bad to make money, any of those things. Essentially, however... All we ever are, like in the first parable, are stewards of God's money. We're stewards. That's what Jesus calls us in another place. And the Bible teaches us really that ultimately none of us own anything. God owns it all. I mean, you don't take any of your money or any of your possessions to heaven. So the alternative to loving money is using money. You can either love money or you can use money to love God and exercise mercy. So you, can, so you can love money not just by, by wanting more of it, but also by, by hoarding it. You can use money that way. I've been thinking a lot about mercy and justice this, this week. And, and this week in our community groups, we're, we're doing the Night of Pope thing. So we're going to be talking about mercy and, and justice. It's an effort for us to to help us become a church that extends mercy and justice to our city. So if you want to just jump into a community group this week and try it out, it's a great week just to, to try. Uh, I think in thinking about mercy and justice, I think when we hear the word mercy, uh, what we usually first think is like pity, like pity for the poor. And then when we think, when we hear the word justice, we think of making up for some wrongdoing. But I'm learning that justice and, and mercy often are more about leveling, leveling things out with the equity of God's kingdom, with the resources that we have. The leveling out of the equity of God's kingdom. I won't, I won't spoil it, but if you have, if you have seen Black Panther, it's, it's where the movie concludes and where it ends, where things end up with sharing resources. Sharing resources. 
A bunch of you did that today. Did you guys see all the blankets stacking up on the Connect booth? Because, you know, we, we feed upwards of like 60 homeless people on Tuesday nights here out in our park or fellowship area outside. Um, and it's been cold. And so they asked if we had some blankets. And so we asked all of you, hey, you got some blankets? You can give away. You guys did that. So, so good job. Thank you for, for sharing the resources that you have. That's the equity of God's kingdom. That's loving our neighbors, loving one another. Tim Keller, he wrote a book on mercy titled Ministries of Mercy. Uh, we have all of our deacons who become deacons here in, in our church read this book. And so I thought I'd read a section of it. He says, we must see that all of us are spiritually poor and bankrupt before God. And even when we put on our best moral efforts for God, we appear as beggars clothed in filthy rags. Yet, in Jesus Christ, God provided a righteousness for us, a wealth straight from the account of the Son of God, who impoverished himself through suffering and death, that we might receive it. We all need mercy. Do you see yourself as a person in need of mercy? You need mercy? Mercy is better than money. Far better. I want to end this point by looking at that, that last Bible reference that Tim Keller points to in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. It says this, Know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, he owns everything. He's the king of heaven. Yet for your sake, he became poor. So that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Every one of us are, are poor sinners. And when it comes down to it, every one of us will, will die and we either go to heaven or hell. That's the future. What Jesus Christ came and offered us is a way to experience the love and mercy of God so that none of us may end up in hell but be able to go to heaven and experience the true riches of God. Jesus is better. Our future is better with him. It's a better future. And that brings us to our last and final point for today, better promise. In this last point, I just want to briefly look at the two places in our passage where Jesus actually talked about the Bible itself and how it, it points to him and the security that comes from knowing and, and believing that. The first place is after the first parable in verses 16 and 17 where he says this, the law and the prophets were until John since then the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone forces his way into it, but it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. The law and the prophets is a way of referring to what we call the Old Testament portion of the Bible, the first half. It's everything that God had written before Jesus came to earth. Once John came and introduced Jesus, the good news of the kingdom was introduced and came. Good news is the word Gospel, which is the title of Luke and the other three books that are written about Jesus and his time on earth. So very clearly what Jesus is bringing up here is, is the Bible, the book called the Bible. Then Jesus points to the surety of trusting the Bible. One of the things the Bible tells us in numerous places is that when Jesus returns, he will remake the heavens and the earth. So the current heaven and earth will pass away. First Peter in the Bible, or Second Peter says that it'll actually be burned up. But even when that happens, the Bible will not pass away. It will not become void. We'll still celebrate the Bible in heaven. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord, the Bible, it stands forever. Every word, even every dot on the words, Jesus says, will still be true and will be fulfilled. But we're supposed to walk away from that as a sense of security that we can, we can trust Jesus in this book. It's, it's the most sure thing in life. More sure than the earth that we walk on and the heavens that we look up at. The promises and truths of the Bible are better and more sure than any other thing. You can count on it. After he says that, Jesus tells this second parable and concludes it by coming back to the Bible again. Always comes back to the Bible. So now let's look at that part in verses 29 through 31. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said, they don't hear Moses and the prophets, so they'll neither be convinced if 
someone should rise from the dead. Moses and the prophets, once again, is a way of referring to the Old Testament stuff that was written before Jesus came. And all that stuff was written, all the stuff before Jesus was written to teach men and, and women that they fall far short of perfection of God's expectations, that they fall into sin and, and need a Savior, and that, and, and, and that God would provide that Savior. That's the whole point, the teach that we need a Savior. The rich man who's in hell thinks that, oh, if someone comes back from the dead to tell his brothers that then they would listen. People still say things like that today. It comes out like, and it's like, oh, you know, nobody really knows what, what happens when you die because nobody's, nobody's died, you know, and gone to the other side to see what's there and then come back from it to tell us about it. That's never, really? There is one person who did. Jesus Christ who rose from the dead after three days. Jesus, such a, he's so coy, such a clever guy. Uh, I mean, he already said in Luke that his plan in coming to earth was, was to die and then three days later to, to rise. That was his mission on earth. He says that multiple times that he does that so that sinners could be forgiven and given eternal life, so that sinners can become saints, like Billy said. So with this line, Jesus is, he's clearly alluding to his death and resurrection which tells us two things. First, if, if we reject the Bible, we'll, re- we'll reject Jesus. You reject the words of the Bible, you reject the Bible, you're going to reject Jesus. That will happen. The Bible is the most sure thing, even surer than seeing Jesus, the risen Jesus himself, Jesus says. I mean, every time, well, look, if I could just see Jesus with my eyes, then I would really believe. Jesus says, no, no. After the disciples saw the risen Jesus, he said these words to him in John 20, 29. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And then two verses later, John says this. He says, these things, the Bible, they're written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life. In his name. <laughs> uh, the Bible is the most sure thing that we can trust. That's the first thing the end of the parable urges us toward. To trust the words and the message of the Bible. The second thing is knowing. The second thing is knowing Jesus points to his resurrection. We can look to the resurrection of Jesus. Which we're going to celebrate in Easter in a few weeks. And see an example of one who's truly come from heaven and, and then has died and then come back to life to tell us what is real about heaven and, and hell, the other side. So Jesus, he, he knows what he's talking about. He's not crazy. He lived to tell the tale, and it's the best kind of tale, one that's actually true. Through risen Jesus, we see proof and evidence that we too can rise again and have Eternal life that begins now and extends to heaven. The promise Jesus offers, it's, it's better than any other promise, more trustworthy than any other words of any other person. His promise is simply better. Well, that's it. We made it through the most difficult chapter in Luke. Congratulations. Uh, it wasn't as painful as I thought it was going to be. Um, there were some diamonds in there, huh? We started out today talking about things that are better than others. We end today talking about Jesus who isn't just better. He's, he's the best. Jesus is the best. He is the one of whom none greater can be conceived. What do you think is better? Money or God's or God? What is better? Love or hate? What is better? Death or life? What is better? Hell or heaven? In Jesus, we, we have a Savior who was rich in heaven, left all his riches to be born among a poor family, live a life of a poor carpenter, to become a traveling homeless man who ended up giving up even the clothes on his back, on a cross, so that we might have true riches found in the love of God. In Jesus Christ are better riches. In Jesus Christ is 
a better future, and in Jesus Christ is a better promise. Jesus is truly better than money. May God help us to love him, believe in him, and trust in him with all of our lives.